I am uh, delighted to and honored to chair the next uh, uh, panel on art and architecture. And I'm also delighted and honored to be joined by one of uh, uh, some of the greatest uh, and most distinguished scholars and practitioners of architecture and urban design, urbanism, uh, that I have known since I've become involved in these two uh, topics. Um, before I introduce uh, the panelists, what I'd like to do is give a quick uh, um, view, a frame uh, as to uh, the kinds of uh, discussions, the kinds of issues that are, that are likely to emerge in, uh, uh, during the next hour and a half. It is not quite clear, I'm sure, to a lot of you how architecture can contribute to the question of civility and democracy. After all, architecture doesn't get up and go. It doesn't speak, it doesn't yell, and certainly it doesn't interrupt the flow of democratic exchange. So how does it contribute to civility and democracy? And that's a, a, a good question. Some might argue it doesn't at all. Obviously, in our panel, we're going to try to reverse that. We're going to say architecture, urbanism do matter uh, to this discourse. And I think you'll see at least two approaches uh, that will make this case. One uh, in which the building is seen as, a, uh, as an exercise in civility and democracy in its own right through restraint and decorum, a, a kind of a Georgian uplift uh, of facades that makes the case uh, about that. And in other words, we can, we can look at it as through the building as not so much an object in space, but as a contributor to uh, urbanism, to urban space, and thus democratic um, exchange. What I'd like to do is elaborate a little bit on, on these two points with some images. Uh, I, I don't want to take too much time, maybe five, ten minutes, just to give you a sense uh, as to, again, some of the discussions that might unfold, and maybe fuel uh, some ideas on your part that uh, you could use to discuss uh, or ask questions later on. And maybe as you're flowing in, in, in the city uh, uh, after this, uh, this uh, conference and, and, and looking around, you could ask those questions of yourselves and over dinner uh, enjoy that. So I'd like to start with the uh, idea that the building is a, an expression of restraint and decorum. What is that? Here I'd like to draw your attention to the role that facades play in this subject. Facades used to be, uh, used to be designed and built in this manner, very much about a face to the public. It's a decorum face. It's a, it's a face that's supposed to mitigate or mediate between inside and outside. Um, not unlike our faces that help us uh, transfer or, or mitigate uh, certain raw and difficult emotions, whether it's about hate or anger or, or some other uh, uh, taboo desires, our faces are our way to, of exchange with the public. Same thing with these facades. They were designed as a way to uh, take care of some raw, perhaps um, even mean functions, banal functions on the inside. Uh, and the, this was like 19th century, late 19th century, early 20th century. Then we begin to see the facades change, take on a different role altogether, uh, reduced to a minimum set of lines, abstract lines of vertical and horizontal steel and glass. And why is that? Well, the story is quite long, and it would take a whole course to go through it. But the brief is that this was about a new moral order. This was less about the facade as a way to allow you to hide behind things, but more about a new transparency. The moral order here is that we, are, we need to shed that uh, barrier between inside and outside and become part of a singular kind of transference. Now, what happens if when, when, when we completely lose these, uh, this matrix of, of, um, uh, of exchange, this matrix that allowed us to discipline our reading of the inside? Well, you get something like this. This is the Farnsworth House uh, in, uh, outside Chicago, completely doing away with the facade, something we can talk about. In the 70s and 80s, we see a new brand of architects coming along and saying, enough is enough. We need to bring the facade, not so much because the last one was uh, ugly, but, the, but that the, new, the city needed those facades to bring people back to the city. Uh, that, that people, this is 70s and 80s, the cities were dead, how are we going to bring people back? So the facade was a way to inspire, to, um, um, yeah, to inspire people to come back and believe in a collective uh, identity. Uh, this is the Portland building, a uh, very famous uh, building around that time, coming around doing extra hard work as a way to say, look, look at me, believe in this place, come back and become part of a democratic uh, exchange. Uh, and it was also a, re a reaction to a lot of 50s projects, uh, federal projects that, I, that Ed was going to talk about in a little bit, 
dry, harsh stack of concrete and steel and glass, less about architecture much, and much more about highway engineering, if you will. Uh, and, and the question for us, a lot of us hated those facades that, that the postmodernist, you know, the architects of, these, of this kind of era brought about. But one of the questions I'd like to put forth for the panels, for all of us, is whether it actually brought back some really good uh, buildings in the city. This is, this is the, uh, the Portland uh, um, Courthouse, Federal Courthouse building right across the street from the Portland building doing really good things about facades, really dignifying the public realm and give us, giving us something to look at and also complexifying the program within the building itself. So that's a question I put before all of us. In the 90s and un until today that we see the facade doing something else uh, c uh, completely. Uh, this time, again, less about the city or anything else, and much more uh, in response to a, a new world order, uh, a, a new um, digital world, a globalized world, where here and there, up and down, we're completely lost. 24-hour cycle, we talked about this, that this morning. We don't understand front and back anymore, and so why should the facade do that uh, uh, in, in that same vein? Why can't we have the facade as a kind of one amalgamated entity, sort of an amorphous thing that travels up and side without any sense of hierarchy whatsoever. This is the Denver uh, Museum doing the same thing, really making for us a very striking uh, intervention, very striking set of forms, again, clearly uh, losing the face, losing the sense of front and back. And what's more important even here is that with the Seattle Public Library closer to home, is that the facade does not, does not only lose like, all these hierarchies, but also loses a sense of uprightness, that sense of dignity that we saw earlier, gone. Now we see a more of an origami uh, folded set of plates that are rising uh, kind of, um, I don't know, aimlessly or from a dormant sleep, long uh, lasting sleep, and, uh, and, and again, kind of completely shuffling the, the order uh, of the city. Um, um, I know Joan is going to talk about that quite a bit, so I'm going to leave it to her. Finally, the other point about the building as a contributor to urban space. Less about an object and much more about an urban space. This is, and I'll, do one, I'll show one slide to get you to think about that and, and ask questions relative to it. This is here in town, River Park Square Mall. It's a shopping mall, going back to the early discussion about shopping. Uh, what, and the question for us is, what kind of a city do we want to have to empower each other to act civilly, democratically? Cities are all about that, really. I mean, it's all about spaces that allow us to come together and, and behave in this kind of an uplifted, uh, dignified manner. So what kind of spaces do we want here? This is an a, 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 a interesting intervention, says a lot. It doesn't quite tell you right off, but it takes somebody like myself to say it. Uh, but it does come around and closes a street. It, it makes business triumph over uh, the street, which is one of the greatest expressions of civility and democracy that we have in the United States. We don't have plazas, we don't have a whole lot of other spaces, but we do have the street, and it has a, the street has an amazing history uh, that goes back to the revolution, uh, pamphleteers coming out and advancing their cause that way, less, again, with fights and big uh, gestures, but the street as a means to uh, advance a point. Here, closed. Business coming around, Nothing wrong with business, I love business, but coming around and closing a fundamental moment in the city as a democratic and civil um, uh, space. What do, we, what do we say about that? What does it mean to us? So uh, those are some of the things I'd like to leave you with. And with that, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Ed Feiner. Um, Ed Feiner uh, serves as director of the Perkins and Will uh, design Leadership Forum. The forum, which includes all Perkins and Will principles, is chartered to ensure the continuity and furtherance of design excellence throughout the firm. Finer is considered to be among the leading experts in the U.S. public buildings design and planning, most notably for the design of courthouses. In 2009, he assumed a leadership position in the Washington, D.C. office as a firm-wide resource. He is best known for his role as the chief architect of the U.S. General Service Administration from 1996 to 2005, where he led the agency's nationwide design and construction program. Over more than a century, American architects have made a succession of claims concerning the ability of architecture to contribute to democratic society. 
These claims have variously ranged from the Whitman-esque hymns of Lewis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright to individual freedom and American exceptionalism to the reformist visions of modern architects in the 1920s and 30s to calls for a symbolically representative new monumentality after World War II, to the populism and pluralism of postmodernism. At times, the architectural rhetoric of democracy has been as hubristic as it has been idealistic, and in many instances, it has devolved in actual practice into empty signifiers. During the early Cold War, for example, the architecture of democracy was a triumphal techno-aesthetic of the type U.S. firms were exporting around the world. Since the 1960s, the invocation of public space as a space of democracy has often been a euphemism for trade-offs between developers and zoning authorities with plazas and outdoor sculptures serving as bargaining chips for extra height or bulk. Today, green architecture risks becoming a similar kind of cliché with LEED certification substituting a system of bureaucratic regulations for real environmentalism. The word civility has been used less frequently in architecture, at least in English, although the related notion of a civil or civic architecture goes back at least to the Renaissance, when it was distinguished as a realm of building practice from military architecture. What these etymological cognates share is an affinity for an established order and code of conventions. Architectural civility is presumably the effort to discover aesthetic correlates for existing social norms and behaviors. Precisely for this reason, we should be careful about employing it as a new architectural watchword. While civility connotes the positive qualities of urban and spatial decorum, it also carries a sense of decorousness. While it partakes of the political, it has a nuance of politesse, excessive politeness. Compared to democracy, which retains a certain robustness, civility has a recessive air about it. The restrained behavior it prescribes implies an ethos of self-discipline, but it also suggests docility or even complacency. My aim is not to split semantic hairs, and few people, I presume, wish to see architecture reduced to good manners. But it's necessary to emphasize that art and architecture, whatever else they are, are first and foremost acts of poetic and social imagination. If architecture reflects life, it does so, as Bertolt Brecht said, with special mirrors. Architecture's job is not just to fit in and be accommodating, but also to challenge and, on occasion, to be obstreperous. The architect need not say an unqualified yes to the status quo or to the client. A favorite cartoon of mine by Saul Steinberg depicts two businessmen sitting across a desk from one another, smiling amicably, but a large thought balloon hovers over the one who's in charge, saying no. Sometimes it's possible for the architect to register a polite dissent using clever forms of dissembling by being witty, tongue-in-cheek, or indeed arch. But it's frequently preferable to address things more frontally or uh, <clears throat> literally to push the envelope. Think of the new brutalism in the 1950s, strenuously defended by its inventors, the architects Peter and Allison Smithson, as an ethical rather than an aesthetic position. Or to take another example, think of the shock administered to the system by Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown with their 1972 book, Learning from Las Vegas, which by scandalously celebrating the dumb and ordinary American landscape as an architectural virtue, or at least a pedagogical value, effectively reversed modernism's elitist pieties with respect to high and low. Frank Gehry did something similar with his famous early house for himself in L.A., made out of chain-link fence and other degraded materials, a classic instance of not-in-my-backyard behavior that flew in the face of his neighbors but changed the course and culture of architecture. <laughs> 
One could give dozens of examples from the history of architecture of the use of bad boy tactics that served, whether as a conscious strategy on the part of the architect or not, to renovate the discipline. To affirm that architecture is primarily a mediated aesthetic discourse is, of course, to acknowledge that the stakes with respect to the consequences of civility and incivility are rarely as high as they are in the realm of, say, politics or religion. On the other hand, we also know that architecture has a profound capacity to affect human experience and relations through its spatial and material qualities. It can cheapen or ennoble. It can be oppressive or liberating. It can be inhospitable or welcoming. It can be deadening or exhilarating. It does not take a behavioral psychologist to suggest that certain physical environments are more conducive to constructive forms of public interchange and encounter than others. Democracy does not depend on real space. Nonetheless, it continues to assume its most vivid expression in actual spaces, however potent the new social and electronic media are proving themselves to be today. In this sense, architecture can aid and abet the aspirations of democracy, as well as other kinds of political systems. Yet as the images broadcast on the evening news demonstrate, citizenship tends to find places of representation and enactment wherever it has to, from the rotunda of the Wisconsin State House to the pavements of Tahrir Square to the Internet. Meanwhile, it's also the case, especially in recent years, that architecture has increasingly aspired to act as an event or to be an experience in its own right. The architect Aldo Rossi once described the task of the architect as that of setting the table for the meal to take place. But architecture now often wants to be the meal itself. And in today's media environment, the consumption of such architecture has the capacity to produce real effects, as for example, in the well-known case of Gary's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao, which by spurring architectural tourism caused a backwater city in the Basque region of Spain to be transformed and rejuvenated almost overnight. The Bilbao effect has spawned many would-be Bilbaos over the last decade, although more recently, with the bursting of the economic bubble, appetites and budgets for this particular urban strategy and phenomenon have chilled somewhat. But in any case, the impact of the recent crop of architectural spectacles on democratic discourse and civic life is at best equivocal. And as I began by suggesting, the meaning or metaphor of democracy, not to mention civility, is never self-evident or stable in architecture. From this perspective, I'd like to focus briefly on two works of architecture that raise such contradictions. Separated by almost half a century, they bracket what might be described as a shift from the monument to the spectacle. The first is the Seagram Building in New York, designed by Ludwig Mies van der Rohe. The second is the Public Library in Seattle, designed by Rem Koolhaas. With respect to our present subject, both buildings refuse to be merely civil. Both radically reimagine and alter the rules of their respective urban contexts. Completed in 1958 on Park Avenue in Midtown Manhattan, the Seagram Building has famously been described as glacially aloof and tragically self-aware of its separation from the city. This description, which comes from the Italian architectural theorist and historian Manfredo Tafuri, a Marxian critic, was intended as praise. Sitting well back from the street on its elevated plinth, Seagram sublimely overlooks the urban scene from behind an austere, dark brown glass facade. By its refusal to engage with its surrounding context, according to Tafuri, the building registers its distance and descent from the capitalist city. Tafuri quotes the writer Karl Kraus. He who has something to say, step forward and be silent. Tafuri's reading is in fact incorrect in my view and a little melodramatic. Indeed, it's possible to view the Seagram building as a paragon 
of urban decorum. Not only its classical symmetry, but its painstakingly finessed setback from Park Avenue along the sloping side streets has the effect of relating it all the more directly to McKim Mead and White's 1916 Beaux Arts Racket and Tennis Club across the street, with which its entry is exactly on axis. At a civilized distance, the high modern Seagram thereby pays homage to its neoclassical neighbor. While Seagram's granite plaza and laconic demeanor project a message of do not enter to those who do not have business inside the building, its sighting also provides welcome aeration from the hubbub of jostling pedestrians and incessant automobile traffic. As far as capitalist critiques are concerned, Mies hardly had any qualms about working for corporate clients. Indeed, upon emigrating from Germany to the United States, in the late 30s, he quickly became one of their favorite architects, adding prestige and refinement to luxury apartment towers and office headquarters. The Seagram building remains one of the most lavish buildings in New York City, not Marx, but rather Medici in its custom design mail chutes, fire alarms, and bathroom fittings, leading Louis Mumford to call it the Rolls Royce of contemporary buildings when it opened. It's also interesting to compare it to its other iconic neighbor, Lever House, completed six years earlier by the firm of Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, which stands diagonally across the street one block north. Lever House holds the street edge with its built-out three-story base, even as its slim shaft rises from just one-sixth of the site. This allows passers-by visual, if not actual, access into its transparent elevator lobby. The building also offers a landscape courtyard at ground level for the public, and on the floors above, what were at the time unusually generous amenities for Lever Brothers employees, a largely female workforce. The paternalism of the company's founder is duly noted on a stainless steel clad column at the entry to the courtyard. Yet these benevolent gestures get swept up urbanistically in the flux of the avenue, and the shiny blue-green glass curtain wall with its flush metal frame lacks Seagram's articulated gravitas. If Lever House embodies a more democratic form of architectural representation, Seagram exhibits the greater civility vis-a-vis -vis the urban milieu. On occasion, Seagram's plaza is reappropriated as a stage for urban happenings, although more regularly its edges serve as ad hoc ledges for eating lunch. Yet both buildings, with their different deportments, add quality to the urban context of Midtown Manhattan and in ways not necessarily programmed by their architects. We may also note that history is fickle with respect to the reception of buildings. While Lever House appeared a brash gesture when it initially opened on Park Avenue, being the first building to break the solid street wall with its height and glass, Within a decade, it was replicated up and down the avenue by lesser imitations, with the exception of the transcendent Seagram. And by the time the gargantuan Pan Am building, now MetLife, was completed in 1963, 10 blocks south at 45th Street, designed by Walter Gropius and his Washington associate Pietro Belusky, Lever House appeared practically demure. Straddling Park Avenue north of Grand Central Station, Pan Am closed off the view corridor like a big thumb in the city's eye, or as the artist Klaus Oldenburg had it, a melting good humor bar. A cartoon in The New Yorker read, It's a sad day when Lever House appears a warm old friend. Another 15 years on, Rem Kulas would celebrate Manhattan's culture of congestion in his book, Delirious New York. For the Dutch architect, monotony in the city was undoubtedly a far worse offense than incivility. Precisely what cities have to offer besides propinquity, in Kuhlhaas's view, is cultural stimulation and the experience of difference. This philosophy of urbanism would come to fruition in 2004 in the Seattle Public Library. Unlike Seagram, the headquarters of a whiskey company whose owner made his fortune during Prohibition, and accordingly wished to burnish his company's reputation with an exclusive button-down monument, Seattle was a deliberate effort to create an urban attraction, 
a building that would reverse the lackluster image of Seattle's downtown and through the glamour and avant-gardism of an internationally acclaimed architect put the city on more than a local map. Traditionally an august temple of knowledge, the Central Library was now radically reinvented by Kulhas for the 21st century according to both updated functional criteria having to do with the inevitable obsolescence of books and irreverent formal ones. As Ayad Rahmani wrote in an article published in Arcade Magazine in 2000, just after the architect made his initial presentation of the project to the public, the scheme brilliantly overturned established hierarchies and reconceptualized the library as a kind of carnival. So was Kulhaz's audacious gesture a democratizing one, or was it more a slap in the face of public taste? The client, of course, was the most public possible. The city's central library system and primary funding for the building came from a citizen-approved bond measure. The design process was exceptionally well documented and intended to be maximally public, as befitting the creation of an institution that should have, as the city librarian put it, the transparency of democracy. Yet despite the unusual lengths to which the library's representatives went to solicit local input and keep Seattle's citizens informed on the project's development, and despite the architect's compliance with requests to make himself or his team available, it remains unclear whether the process was more about public accountability or about public relations management. As Shannon Mattern has pointed out in an essay titled, Just How Public Is the Seattle Public Library? Publicity, Posturing, and Politics in Public Design, written when the building was in its final stages of construction, the ultimate design, while incorporating a number of suggestions that came out of protracted community discussions, differed little in substance from the architect's initial diagram. This is not too surprising. Notwithstanding Kulhaz's vaunted design methodology based on research, as opposed to, say, aesthetics, public opinion has never been among his privileged data sets. As far as the building itself is concerned, its vortex-like presence in Seattle's downtown has undoubtedly pumped energy and excitement back into the heart of the city, much as Gary's Museum has done in Bilbao. It has generated great civic pride and boosted the urban economy. Unlike Seagram, though, Kulhaz's singular building does not function as part of an urban ensemble. Its hyperactive presence calls attention mainly to itself. From inside the dazzling lozenge-shaped grid of glass, which clads all exterior surfaces, deftly frames fractured views of the city. But these vistas seem to accentuate the skyline's vacuity. And the view through the bars is rather carceral, positioning viewers, a la Kulhaz's self-proclaimed paranoid critical method, as voluntary or involuntary prisoners of architecture. While reviews in the press at the time the building opened were unanimous that the library was among Kulhaz's very best buildings to date, and the continuing large crowds seen prima facie evidence of its popularity, more meditated opinion has to some extent divided around whether one looks at the library primarily as a tourist or as a reader. From the latter perspective, functional shortcomings in the circulation and shelving systems and shoddy finishings on surfaces and furniture have elicited a quiet but steady stream of complaints. Although in a building of this ambition, perhaps such flaws are inevitable and in some cases may be fairly easily remedied. But as a tourist who saw the building in 2006, what I find most remarkable was that the architect had managed to sell all that extravagant glass to, of all people, librarians. Cubic volume not only takes precedence over bound volumes in the Seattle Library, but it also dominates all other activities, however ingeniously and stylishly reprogrammed. So, from Seagram to Seattle, whenever I try to imagine how a later period will look back at the architecture of this one, 
I think that our highly literal obsession at the beginning of the 21st century with mobility and transparency, especially these days, our fetish of escalators, ramps, and hyperkinetic experiences will be seen less as evidence of architecture's dynamism and vitality than as a symptom of the profession's frantic attempt to compete with the warp speed of contemporary media and information. Treating architecture, even metaphorically, as largely about its circulation systems is like treating human beings as if they were principally about the fluids coursing through their bodies. Still, the messenger cannot be wholly blamed for the message. A prominent public building like the Seattle Public Library is enmeshed in today's culture of spectacle, tied to an economy that demands a certain kind of urban renovation in the interest of attracting global tourism, and designed for a client whose very reason for being is threatened with extinction in the contemporary electronic maelstrom. Paradoxically, these social and cultural forces may be understood as having both democratizing and hollowing out effects on embodied space. They are unlikely to promote civility, yet architects can hardly deny these forces, even if it's also the task of their buildings to rise above them. Thank you. And in doing so, we sort of learn to use these tools of uh, democratic organizing, if you will, uh, to reconstruct in some very distressed areas uh, that sense of belonging, that sense of uh, uh, public and civic identity. And we started to suspect as we did this that the people that we worked with in these diverse settings uh, were, in the, at the end of the day, I guess as Winston Churchill would have predicted, a little bit like their towns and buildings. Uh, and we developed a kind of grudging respect for institutions like the New England Town Meeting, which is supposed to be this uh, surviving uh, uh, space of direct democracy, Athenian, if you will. Turns out to be one of the most recalcitrant political institutions you could possibly imagine. Uh, and I invite you all to participate in them once, sometime. <laughs> Uh, hopefully with a project that everybody wants to see. Uh, but these, these crusty New Englanders in little villages, as opposed to the very tough urban neighborhoods that we also worked in, were a little bit like their architecture, very, uh, very proper in a way, very restrained, uh, very elegant, uh, like the white clabber churches on the green, but also sort of uh, uh, puritanically parsimonious, never spending a nickel on anything that they saw as absolutely not uh, required and necessary. So that concept of citizenship is my final one, and that is the one where buildings themselves start to act like citizens. Uh, and the more you look for this, uh, the more entertaining it becomes. So that great uh, uh, institutions of uh, uh, civic uh, life uh, that are associated with the era of industrial uh, urbanism in the United States, like a factory band, for example, you can easily imagine, in fact, you can only imagine it playing slightly out of tune as it moves down the streets of a typical working class neighborhood. Now, these are precisely the neighborhoods that we now work with as, since they've lost the factories, uh, since they've become, since they've lost uh, the economic wherewithal that made those people so touchingly optimistic about where they and their children were going in the future. And we should remember when we talk about the incivility of broken windows and abandoned buildings uh, and suggest that all these neighborhoods really do need to do to pick themselves up by their own bootstraps is just to uh, uh, gussy themselves up a little bit. And believe me, there's a lot of that in urban design and urban planning these days. We should remember uh, that profound sense of loss uh, that uh, has driven those neighborhoods to become exemplars in so much of the popular press of architectural incivility. A colleague of mine calls it Detroit porn, uh, uh, the, the kind of conspicuous display of these deteriorated urban neighborhoods. But they are uh, a kind of fundamental place. Now, that can obviously go to extremes. I apologize for this slide when uh, decorum and civility and order
uh, in themselves get radically out of control and the behavior of people and the behavior of their buildings winds up in a way which becomes, if nothing else, disturbing. But more often than not, American architecture has been a kind of uh, unruly uh, mob uh, and, uh, uh, and, and in a glorious sort of way. That unruliness, I think, is an important part of the way we see our cities as I finish up here. I see Ali uh, looking over his shoulder desperately at me. Uh, it was, of course, seen in the uh, early part of the 20th century as that cartoon describes it as chaos, as an example of this wonderfully vital industrial urbanizing country uh, that didn't have the aesthetics uh, that uh, it deserved. Uh, didn't have Ed Finer, it didn't have the maturity to produce a truly elegant and monumental architecture. That only happened in, in, not on American main streets, uh, but in European cities. And so the grand plans of the City Beautiful movement wanted to take that slightly unruly, commercial, laissez-faire city, if you will, and civilize it. Uh, make it look uh, like it uh, uh, belonged uh, uh, on the boulevards of Paris. And that was not just the streets, but it was also the public buildings. Interestingly, when it happened, it tended to happen incrementally. That's what Michigan Avenue really looks like, and it's not so bad. And that's what the Civic Center in San Francisco looks like, and it's not so bad as well. It provides a wonderfully accessible public space, even though the grand plan, which was supposed to provide the entourage, for those public buildings uh, went the way after the earthquake, again, of American laissez-faire uh, 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 real estate development. So that tension, if you will, which I think is fundamentally American, uh, between a sense of, uh, of, of the importance of civic monuments, of civic design, of order, of a higher aspiration, always in a fundamental intention with our impatience to get on with it with our impatience with rules, with our impatience that's been referenced already of people telling us how we should behave, whether as citizens or buildings. And I think that is something that we can appreciate uh, because our critics like Robert Venturi in 1966, John Brinkerhoff Jackson, people with the most sensitive eyes, have seen precisely that tension, that dialectic, uh, between our glorious uh, but rare monuments to order uh, and clarity in the description of ideals of public life like Jefferson's University of Virginia, which nobody, no architect certainly would dare admit they don't love. Uh, 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 but also, in Venturi's very naughty way that Joan, Joan referenced, the idea that there's also an order to Main Street, a cacophonous order, an order that is as much part of our civic life and culture as anyplace else. And I think European architects have always had a little bit of a hard time understanding that. Uh, and uh, it's, it, it, they, they tend to celebrate the most extreme version uh, of American freedom or condemn it. So on the one hand, you get Leon Creer on the left suggesting that the free, open, loose fit uh, order of the American landscape is a place of, as he describes it, you can't read the fine print, a place of damnation. Uh, or you get Rem Kulhas celebrating exactly the same sense of freedom and liberation and autonomy of the individual building, the liberation, as Joan, of course, beautifully described it, of the architect to do whatever they damn well please. Uh, but uh, celebrating that sort of li liberation uh, in the shaping of American cities as a free field with their looseness of fit between citizen and central government, between building and urban plan, so characteristic of the American landscape. But it is, and I, I would say in conclusion, because I have to conclude, uh, something that we should probably describe in something like the oxymoronic terms uh, of uh, the French uh, Marxist philosopher Althusser as a relative autonomy. Because indeed, the best and most touching American places are precisely about that balance between order and chaos, between order, if you will, and unruly self-expression. The ability of a little courthouse square, that's Winterset, Iowa. Anybody know about Winterset, Iowa? John Wayne comes from Winterset, Iowa. There's your piece of trivia for the day. Um, and the relationship between that ridiculously uh, pompous uh, courthouse that somebody probably added that dome to in the Victorian period because they thought it made it rather grander uh, and the uh, wonderful diversity of the commercial architecture around it. That play is really, I think, fundamental, and maybe we see it best uh, when we compare it 
uh, to, as de Tocqueville did, uh, to compare it to uh, where we came from uh, and understand uh, that the expression of citizenship through American urban spaces and through American architecture is a much more complex and chaotic process uh, than any formula or any building code uh, or any design philosophy would likely give us. Thank you. In the interest of time, here's what I'd like to do. Uh, rather than me asking the first question, I know, I know, I know. No, no, I'm not done with that one. Uh, we still have one more, one more presenter. But uh, you know, I was going to ask about my first one or two questions. But try to. Uh, what I like to do is basically open the floor to you, so you can ask the question rather than me. So uh, hopefully that we can get uh, caught up on time that way. Our next uh, presenter is Witold Rabinski. Uh, he is of Polish parentage, was born in Edinburgh, raised in London, and attended Jesuit schools in England and Canada. He studied architecture at McGill University in Montreal, where he also taught. He is currently the Martin and, May and Margie Mayerson Professor of Urbanism at the University of Pennsylvania. His architectural experience has included designing houses as a registered architect, as well as researching low-cost housing, for which he received a 1991 Progressive Architecture Award. In 1993, he was made an honorary fellow of the American Institute of Architects, and he has received honorary doctorates from McGill University and the University of Western Ontario. In 2007, he received the Vincent Scully Prize, the Seaside Prize, and the Institute Collaborative Honors from the AIA. He serves on the U.S. Commission on Fine Arts. Please welcome with me, with all the reason. I also scribble from time to time, but that didn't make it into my biography, apparently. Like Ed, I started with a definition. I used a different dictionary, but they're basically the same definition. And I was thinking how this applied to architecture, how, how civility applied to architecture. It certainly doesn't apply to architects. Architects, as you heard, can be long-winded. But they're always simple. They're always simple because we work with clients. And we have to charm them. We have to convince them of our ideas. So we can't afford to be uncivil to them. We can perhaps be uncivil to ourselves, but we're professionals. So that's a rule that we also don't break very often. But buildings can be civil, I think. And I thought there were two ways in which buildings are civil. One is that they respect their surroundings, whether it's a street, whether it's the building across the street, as you heard previously, whether it's a field, a cornfield, whatever the surroundings are, buildings are in places and they have to respect that and relate to it in some way. And they can do it in a civil way or they can do it in a look at me way. And while sometimes a look at me way is appropriate, usually it isn't. And that's because of the second reason, which is less obvious, and that is that buildings have to have, I can't read the slides up there too far away, but buildings have to have a sense of propriety. In a courthouse and a house are not the same sort of building. If a courthouse looks like a house, it looks like one of those buildings that Ed showed, which is sort of amusing, and we say, what were they thinking? Why didn't they do a nice building? It's an important building. But conversely, if a house looks like a courthouse, you say, who does he think he is? <laughs> That's what McMansions are, basically. They're not big houses, nothing wrong with a big house. It's that they're trying to look bigger than they ought to be. They're trying to look like something more than they should look like. So propriety and decorum are important. And I think that's the second aspect that uh, <coughs> the causes of incivility, and I'll, I'll show some examples, but just to jump ahead, uh, and we've heard these last night and today. I mean, we're a publicity-oriented culture, we're rather a crude culture, getting cruder by the day. <laughs> the media plays an important role in this, and in terms of the media wants one-liners, and a building that's a one-liner is a building that does that, and then you get a picture, it's on the news, and that's it. You, you don't need subtlety will not make it in that kind of world. 
Uh, and finally, we have this kind of entertainment ethic, which we've also heard about in terms of politi politics has become a branch of entertainment. And architecture has also become a branch of entertainment. So architecture is in our culture, and so it's not immune from any of these forces that we've heard about that infect politics and, and other fields. And so buildings that become entertainment are like fireworks. You know, everybody loves fireworks, but not every night. <laughs> not all the time. And so what should be a very special thing in architecture has often become a very kind of serial thing. And it's also become something that is a that is used in buildings that are that shouldn't have ever fireworks. Fireworks are an important thing. We, we celebrate special national holidays and special events with fireworks. We don't just say, let's have some fireworks tonight. <laughs> and finally, but if I can contribute a little thing, because it seems to me also a part of incivility, is that increasingly public and private are getting confused. We used to be very strict about what was public and what was private. And I'm talking about behavior and dress and comportment, all of these things, and architecture we had a line between public and private, and we knew when it was what. And that line is, has been crumbling. So unlike the historians, I don't believe that this is a question, at least in architecture, of something that is part of our culture and it just recurs. This is, this is a long downward slope that, that has been going on really for the last 40, 50 years. And, and it has to do with people wearing baseball caps everywhere. It has to do with people not knowing how to dress. And, and so dress, which used to be for sports or leisure or sleeping, suddenly becomes public dress. That may be a good thing or a bad thing. If, if you think relaxation and self-expression is good, I suppose it's a good thing. In architecture, it's a problematic thing, though, because architecture does have public faces and private faces. And there are public buildings and private buildings. There are things that you do in public that you don't do in private and vice versa. And so this confusion of public and private affects architecture. And I think not to the good and creates some of this incivility and this confusion. Uh, I serve on the Fine Arts Commission in Washington. It's a commission that was founded by Daniel Burnham in 1908. Uh, and we oversee the aesthetics of federal buildings in the, in the city as well as any building in certain parts of the city as well as odd things like metals and coins and things like that but our most important role i think is to look at memorials so every memorial that is built in washington of course there are many because it's the national capital comes before the commission always has and the commission opines not very democratically we're simply giving our opinion but in the case of memorials it's an opinion which the architect must listen to uh, this was the plan that won the Washington Memorial Competition, Robert Mills in 1845, a rather grandiose building with this, the world's biggest obelisk, which is, as I said, we're a crude culture, and we, we need to do people. Uh, and then a very complicated building at the base, which was a sort of pantheon of revolutionary heroes, uh, the story of the revolution. There was even a place for George Washington who was actually lying in Mount Vernon, but they hoped they could convince his relatives to move in there. Uh, and usually the Washington Memorial is credited to Robert Mills, but it's really Thomas Lincoln Casey who I think deserves the lion's share of the credit. He was an engineer who worked for the Army Corps of Engineers, and he was given the job of finishing the memorial after it basically was one-third finished for decades, and it became an embarrassment to everybody. And Casey stripped away everything. Uh, the, the lower building had never been built, and he just abandoned that. He didn't even try to build it. But Mills had even built some decoration moldings, and Casey took all that out and created this, what is the most beautiful monument in, in the city, which is this, this perfect obelisk. He gave it a taper. It, you saw it before. It was a kind of stump. He gave it this beautiful taper and then a big pyramid at the top that sort of shoots it up in the sky. One of the things that he achieved, and I think it's a characteristic of great memorials, is that it's a very ambiguous monument. You know, what's this about George Washington? Like, there's no writing on the monument. There, Washington's name does not appear anywhere. There's nothing there about his life, you know, his, his achievements as a commander, none of that. Uh, it's this enormous scaled obelisk, which, it, which is the scale of the mall, so I think it, it's appropriate. It's not, it's not out of scale. But it, it's this national monument, which we call the Washington Memorial, but 
I don't think it's just a memorial to Washington. It's a memorial to something else. I don't know what, because you can read into it whatever you want, which I think you should do with a memorial. And, and when people come up to it, and it's just this enormous blank stone face that just goes on forever, uh, you don't know what it is. It's a this beautiful abstract thing. One of my favorite memorials in Washington is the World War I DC Memorial, and it's a little temple. It was designed by Frederick Brooke, and it honors the 499 people from the district who died in World War I. Uh, it's a tiny little temple, what architects call a tempietto. Uh, in fact, it's a, it's a little bandstand. It was the, the requirement was that the Marine Corps band had to fit into it. And John Philip Sousa actually conducted the Marine Corps band when the monument was inaugurated. And it's, a, it's very beautiful because you, most people don't find it. It's very small. Uh, it's only about these 499 people. Their names are listed on the monument. Uh, but you get the sense of this little, beautiful little structure, dome structure. It's just being restored after being years of neglect. Frederick, uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, was having a conversation late in life with Felix Frankfurter, who was a good friend of his. And he said, you know, when I die, I just want something the size of my desk. And it should be marble, it should last, it should be a nice memorial, and I just want my name on it and the dates, and I don't want anything else. And 20 years after Roosevelt's death, a, a group of his friends got together and erected this memorial, which is the size of a desk. It's about six feet long, you know, four, three and a half feet wide, about three feet high. And, and indeed, as you see, it has his name on it and the dates. Uh, the, his friends were anonymous. I think their names are buried under the memorial. So it was, it was a wonderful kind of statement of, of, of a president who sort of saw his place in history and didn't feel, and it was also, I think, a statement of another time. He didn't, he didn't see himself as Lincoln and Jefferson, of course, had entire buildings. You know, what would, what would FDR have thought of the memorial that we did finally build? In seven and a half acres every water feature known to man, <laughs> about half a dozen sculptors, uh, a section for each one of his terms, including the little truncated term at the end, uh, the, set, the, the one of the, the Second World War somehow expressed in boulders and water, very overwrought. Very important memorial though, because it changed the rules of memorials. It said, you know, if Lincoln gets, I'm sorry, if FDR gets seven and a half acres, that becomes the new standard. And so instead of simply a plinth or a desk, you now have these horizontal memorials, which are really about landscape and creating a whole environment, and also a lot about education, because that memorial is full of stuff about the Depression and about the war and about everything he did, and, and, and they didn't put in the wheelchair, so they had to add the wheelchair, and, but they had to take out the cigarette, because, you know, show them smoking, so it was, it was this whole charge off the process. The Vietnam Memorial is, was, was highly thought of because it in, also introduced a new element to memorials, which was to memorialize victims rather than heroes. So the, the soldiers and memorials had been killed in the war, but there was a sense that it was as much for the survivors as for the soldiers. So this was a very new concept. It's also a very large memorial. It takes about three and a half acres. So the, the idea of spreading out is is present also in that memorial. It's not a modest scale uh, building or structure at all. Because of the great success of the uh, Vietnam Memorial, it had enormous influence. And so basically almost every memorial built afterwards has to have a wall. And it has to have things written on the wall. And this is the Korean War Memorial, which has a wall, it has soldiers, it has a flagpole, it has a basin of water, it has the names of all the countries who participated, it has the names of battles, it just goes on and on and on. And, and it basically sinks under the weight of all this information. Because it's no longer about memorializing, it's about teaching people that, about the war, what was it about, and, and memorials simply cannot support that amount of stuff. Uh, World War II, I think, hits the the high point in terms of size, because it's seven and a half acres. Uh, it is part of an urban design sort of 
basin was already there, the, the monument was built around it. Uh, but I think it also runs into trouble. It commemorates the 50 states. For what reason, I don't know. South Shore. Yes, I'm sure. <laughs> but what, what, did the, what role did the states play? It commemorates, it tells us too much. And then it fills it with sort of jolly sparkling water, which somehow feels wrong. It doesn't feel like the, the Second World War. It feels like it's too happy. It's, it's hard to make fountains look there probably is one in the world, but it's hard to make fountains look serious and, and sort of have, have gravitas. They, they always look sparkly and, and too happy. <laughs> this summer, later this summer, the Martin Luther King Memorial will open. Uh, four acres seems to have been the, the standard for memorial. So it, it, it's about four acres. It has a very large wall with his sayings in it. It's a, a beautiful site right on the tidal basin facing the Jefferson Memorial in a very kind of poignant way uh, so that, that you have Jefferson, who after all was a slave owner, and Martin Luther King, who, who freed in some ways people. And so you've got this interesting relationship. Uh, other than this giganticism which has infected our memorials comes through in a statue just 60 feet tall. It's the biggest representation of a person in, in any of the Washington Memorials. By comparison, if you've ever seen Jefferson, he's 19 feet tall in the Jefferson Memorial. He seems big when you see him. Uh, I don't think the statue is too big for the site. It, outdoors, it will probably be okay. But there is something odd about having Martin Luther King uh, commemorated in this way. It doesn't seem to me like what the man was about to have a 60 foot statue. Uh, the, the commission, and I was sitting on it at the time this went through, was very uncomfortable with the statue and never actually approved the statue, but somehow it's one of those political things, the process went ahead uh, anyway. The, the next memorial is, and there's, a, there's always a memorial in the pipeline, because because for some reason, we've gotten really attached to building memorials. There were very few memorials built on the Mall for, for the longest period of time. And then there's a flurry of them. After Vietnam, you get a regular beat of memorials. My own guess is that it has to do with the fact that our culture is so impermanent. It's all digital. Everything disappears. Everything that you own is out of date in 10 years. Nothing that you own will be around when you die because it, it's all kind of... And so we, we sort of get attached to these memorials because we feel it will be there. And it will. But the National Park Service takes very good care of the memorials and those memorials are there forever. And so we're somehow, even as we've created a very kind of fragile culture, we're very fascinated by this idea of something permanent. But we're terribly concerned about what will it say, how will it be commemorated, and, and I think that's where we get into trouble. This is the Eisenhower Memorial, which Frank Gehry is designing. Uh, it's, it's in the process. This is a, a, the current state of the design. This is not necessarily what will be built. It, it, he's really struggling with it because he has a very difficult site. It's in front of the education building, which you can just see in the back. Oops. Can I get back in there? The education building is in the back, uh, and, and Gary wants to create screens. He calls them tapestries, but they're like huge squares, 10 stories high, uh, enormous things. And there's a lot of debate and discussion about is how, how are these things going to look? Nobody has ever seen one of them. And there's a lot of pushback, and we love the columns, but we're very leery of the screens, and I think it's, it's going to be a, a real struggle for him to figure out how to do it. So unlike, this is uh, Eisenhower's memorial in London, in, in Romer Square, in front of the American Embassy. Uh, simply a statue, uh, not a great sculpture, but a, a kind of, seemed an appropriate representation of the general. Uh, it's a sort of reminder that in, in the case of memorials at least, this is not about this is how we do things in America and it goes back and forth. That there's a definite trend here towards bigger and more complicated and more stuff in the memorial, more 
every memorial in the future is going to have a visitor center because then you can sell books and you can sell t-shirts and hats and it's that shopping thing that people want to go to the memorial. They don't want to just look at the memorial, they need to buy something and take it home. Uh, that was never the case before. None of the early memorials in Washington had anything to explain to you who Lincoln was. They did not, there is no sign in front of the Lincoln Memorial that says Lincoln. But there, his speeches are there. And the, 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 what is it, the first inaugural and the Gettysburg Address are there. And, but it's, it's assumed that you know that and there's this sense of privacy. So when you go to the Lincoln Memorial, it's full of people they're all jostling, you have kids, and all sorts of people, and yet it's a very private moment. You can see people just staring at those speeches and reading them, and he sort of looms above you, but not in a disagreeable way, and he looks kind of worried and tired, and not sort of godlike, because although he's in a temple, so you, it, it was a very tricky sort of memorial, I think, the design for French and Bacon. Uh, but we moved very far from that. Uh, so I don't, this is not about, remedies, but it's about, I think, for me, it's more about concern. It seems we're moving to these, and, it, and it's about incivility. It's about the sense that we have to make these, what become propagandistic statements rather than commemorations. Thank you. Well, uh, I'd like to open the uh, questions to the audience and see if you have anything before I interject my two cents here, so that we can make sure that you benefit from this discussion, not just us. Any questions? Go ahead. Um, I have to preface my question. Well, I'm Tabitha Erdian. Why don't you wait for the microphone to come up? Hi, I'm Tabitha Erdy. I'm a PhD candidate at WSU. Um, and I have to preface this with, uh, I work for the National Park Service, so most of the time I'm a government worker in the boonies, where we don't have large majestic buildings to tell us who we're working for. Um, sometimes if you're lucky enough to work in one of the glamorous National Park Service. But anyways, um, as the panel spoke of government buildings, these buildings are often located in urban spaces. Um, but I have to wonder about the relationship between government buildings located in urban spaces the governments that occupy these buildings and their rural constituents. Um, is it possible for this urban architecture, i.e. the design excellence program, to speak to rural constituents in a, in a way that these buildings seem so foreign to them being from a rural area? Or can this urban architecture alienate rural constituents and contribute to incidents? That's not that's you. All right, I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, it's ironic that this need, this conference is being held in uh, Spokane um, because the story that we normally tell is that um, the federal presence, and we really don't have enough time today to go into the depth of that, but the federal presence was very important as the nation expanded west. And in every town, and these were all rural communities at the beginning, that the first building that was made out of masonry was usually the federal building, the courthouse. And whether it was Billings or whether it was Spokane, any of the western cities, that the federal government wanted to make its mark and place itself within those communities. So that even when I was working on courthouses all over the United States, I went to, to towns that I didn't even know existed that we were building buildings in. Um, uh, I didn't know, for example, um, that there was a London, Kentucky. You wouldn't know. Um, I didn't know at the it's time. Not far from Versailles. Right. <laughs> 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 uh, it was funny. It was funny that London is. I didn't. I didn't know at the time that it was the capital of the marijuana district of Kentucky. So there was a reason to have a federal courthouse. But, <laughs> 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 or the Congress and the Senate who got it through the Congress. Um, but the, the idea was that every federal building that was built in rural communities, towns and cities, whatever scale they were, was supposed to be a representation of the federal presence, representing all three um, branches of government, the judiciary, the legislation, the legislative branch, and the executive branch. Every courthouse has representation of all three branches of government so that even in small towns and cities all over the country, and 
very rural border stations in the middle of no place, and yet border stations are programmatic to actually be, even though we don't think of them this way, um, that they're welcoming people into the United States. These are the land border stations. And the art and architecture is very, very vivid program in border stations because they become part of the message that these are portals into the United States. So uh, it's, it's not just rural versus urban. Um, it's ironic we're here, but if we were having this conference in Boston talking about rural or you know the back areas of the country, it wouldn't mean as much. But the West is probably the best example of where the federal building or courthouse was the first real mark of the presence of the federal government. I, I have to pick that up just briefly. First of all, to defend Kentucky because you realize that we we were a hemp growing state before the city. and the hemp was used to bale cotton, which came from the south. When after that economy was transformed, we didn't have anything to do with that hemp, so we did eventually find something else. To do. But, the, but the, the, on, a, on a more serious note, maybe not more serious, um, I think it's a good question because I think there is a struggle. Uh, you know, the federal government can sometimes. You know, all due respect to Edward, express itself locally in a fairly heavy-handed way. It's not accidental that so many of the state capitals are based on the national capital building, and even those little county courthouses. I think feel like they have to be a mini state capital somehow. But the most, I think, the most compelling are the ones that are again a sort of tension between local and regional influences. And some of the best federal architecture that was done was done during the New Deal when there was, I think, a much more explicit attention to regional issues. In fact, the best stuff, I think, in the state parks, uh, well, there's an older tradition that goes back to Awani, and things, but, but a lot of the best stuff in the, in the national parks was done in the, under the WPA and in that period too. And a lot of that wasn't even architecture, thank God. It was just trailblazing and a kind of real interaction. It was a period, I think, in the environmental uh, movement that we're going to be rediscovering more and more. Uh, and again, I think it has to do with the balance between this larger identity and a sense of local place and local identity. So I wouldn't, uh, I mean, I think it, it, the more complicated, I, I have, a, you know, not to pick a fight again, but I mean, I have an issue with some of the, uh, the, the, the best architecturally, for, uh, GSA architecture, precisely because I have to say, I've seen, I, Tom Main is a friend of mine, so I say this in a guarded way. Uh, the, the, I think he's a spectacular architect in many respects. But there, there is a sense when you've seen his building here that you've also seen the building there, and that the one in Eugene, which I only saw under construction, truth in lending, uh, could just, for my money, as easily be in Los Angeles. We, we can debate that later. Okay. <laughs> Right, one, one more question, one short one. Okay. My name is Miron Medini. Um, I have a question, uh, and maybe is it first uh, uh, I explain about my talk, and then uh, the question is related to that. Uh, I think if we, we are linking democracy and uh, civility to architecture and art, uh, it's not fair to, uh, uh, if we do not talk about the urban design and landscape urbanism um, and uh, bring them in this real uh, if uh, I think by by the cross-disciplinary uh, perspective that we can talk about the social uh, social spatial uh, factors of democracy and uh, we can integrate uh, private spaces to uh, public spaces and uh, we can then talk about uh, people's social location social uh, uh, position in the society and also their contribution to the society, then we can uh, have a better idea about the, the democracy. So my question is, uh, how we, uh, uh, um, how, how do you evaluate the uh, contemporary phenomena of the sub <coughs> um, in terms of giving meaning to, uh, to democracy and civility? Do you, do you think it's uh, promoting uh, I mean, this urban setting is promoting democracy, or it's declining. Democracy. Thank you. Alan, I, I've already judged. 
but I'm willing to take it. Um, uh, it's anecdotal, but um, but the Minneapolis courthouse, um, the day that it was um, dedicated, um, I was at the dedication, and there was a demonstration in the plaza that was built in between the courthouse and City Hall. And it was something about the environmentalists fighting um, the destruction of forest land in Minnesota. And you had people running around dressed like trees. It was very simple, um, but they were dressed like trees. And Martha Schwartz was the um, designer of the, um, of the sculpture and the landscaping of the plaza. And they were trees, actually. They were. Um, but the woman that sat next to me um, was very upset. She said, why would they have to pick a day like this to demonstrate and make a lot of noise while we're dedicating the courthouse. And uh, you know, she said this to me, and I, I was trying to be civil. And I said to her, well, that's the reason we built the plaza, for the demonstrations. <laughs> and, and it's very true. There, that is a remarkable opportunity. Um, I didn't discuss iconic locations of where you put buildings, where you should put public buildings, how they fit into the context and the fabric of a city, but those became very much part of the discussion as to how you relate to the other elements of the community. And in that case, that has become probably the major public square in the city of Minneapolis. And it is where people demonstrate when they're unhappy with their government. And it's just part of the dialogue, how you facilitate the, that dialogue between the people and their government. Thank you all very much for being here. We'll take about 15 minutes and try to reconvene here just shortly after. Three.